When you have big data sets and you have ambitions for doing big analyses, there's really no way around it. Things are going to take big time. <laughs> That's right. Come here anytime you want your favorite dad jokes and bad puns. Hey folks, I'm Pat Schloss and this is Code Club. In the recent episodes, we've been kind of stepping through thinking about how we can use a new package developed by my lab called MicropML to apply machine learning algorithms to microbiome data. We've been working with L2 regularized logistic regression, which of the different approaches that are possible is about the fastest they come, right? So as we kind of move along, we might want to add more sophistication to our modeling. We might want to say do random forest. Random forest is gonna take considerably longer than L2 logistic regression. Um, and you know the, the hope is that the performance will be quite a bit better uh, because there's perhaps advantages there, right? There's also other things that we would like to do even with our logistic regression, like figure out you know what features or what taxa in our model are driving the classification. All these things take a lot of time. And so that's why I'm spending some time going through thinking about different ways that we can speed up the analysis and implementation of our model. In the last episode, I showed you how we can use functions from the fur package, uh, which is a play on per, uh, which gets us all those nice map functions. Well, the fur packages, the fur package gives us fur map uh, and related functions so that we can parallelize all those map operations. I want to take a step back and instead of doing, say, a hundred splits in one script, I want to have one script do one split. What that will get me is that I can now use my favorite tool in the whole wide world, which is make. <laughs> um, and GNU make uh, works on the command line with Mac and Linux. Um, you can also get it for Windows. It's just a little bit heavier of a haul. And so what make allows you to do is keep track of dependencies. And why I like make is because I think of kind of creating out a, a pipeline and data analysis as a series of dependencies. And Make works really nice on my laptop, on my computer, but works really well on a high performance computer where I can send off a hundred different jobs to all run at the same time and then come back and pull that information together. So I'm going to get there eventually, right? To, to kind of this big vision of a Make file that I fire off on my high performance computer and show you how my lab uses Slurm on uh, the University of Michigan's high performance computer. But before we do that, I wanna show you how I would use Make to break this down into simple steps so that we can then kind of pull it all together. Um, and, and this will also be a framework that we could then use up on a high performance computer. Anyway, let's go ahead over to our studio. So I've already got a make file created that goes ahead and populates my raw data directory with the files that we've been using through these uh, tutorials. So I'm gonna go ahead and create another R script that I'm going to be using with my make file. Um, this isn't totally how I would do it in real life, but I wanna be able to keep these other uh, standalone files that you know work more natively in R Studio in the repository. So, so we'll do a little bit of things that aren't quite dry. Anyway, hopefully you'll forgive me. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to have code that takes data from those three files, the three Baxter files, the shared file, the taxonomy file, and the metadata in um, the raw data directory. And that pulls that all together. And that then also does the pre-processing step for us. So this R script is going to be the stand-in for my genusml.r script. And if I zoom this or make this a little bit bigger, so I will go ahead and for now copy this over to my untitled. And let me kind of briefly explain what's going on in here. Um, so we source the code genusprocess.r script. Um, we load microbml. We then loaded fur. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of all the fur stuff because this isn't going to be parallelized within the script. Um, it then reads in uh, the data that was outputted from code genus process.r. So code genus process.r takes the shared file, the taxonomy file, and the metadata file, blends that all together. Um, and then this uh, code chunk from lines four through nine is getting it into a format that works well with pre-processed data which goes about removing any columns. And so in the, for this data, those columns are our relative abundance data. 
uh, those relative abundances for those taxa that have near zero variance. Um, it will also then center and scale the data so that the mean is zero and that um, the, the data, the scaled data has a standard deviation of one. Uh, we then have our test um, hyperparameters for the L2 um, uh, regularized logistic regression. I'm gonna go ahead and remove that 10 uh, because the values that were optimal were like two and three. So we'll, we'll leave that for the test hyperparameters. We then run get SRN genus results um, with the seed. And I'm gonna go ahead and then remove all this other stuff um, because that's not so important to me right now. Um, this is the stuff after the fact that kind of takes all the splits and joins it together so that we can do inference on those splits to figure out which uh, hyperparameter, which, which lambda value was optimal, okay? So I'll also go ahead and remove this function so I want this to be an executable script. So I'll go ahead and add my shebang line. So it'll be the shebang and then user bin env r script. Um, and so that makes it so that we can run it from the command line as long as the script is executable. So we'll do a chmod plus x on code run split dot r. And so if we look at uh, the contents of code, we now see that run split has those X's, which means it's executable. But what we need to do is get the parameters from the command line. So we can do the function command args, and then we can do trailing only equals true. And we will call this seed. Uh, I think command args is gonna come in as a character, however. So I wanna make sure this is numeric. So I'll do as.numeric on that, save it, um, and this all looks good. Uh, the one thing we don't have, however, is any type of output, but let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. I'm gonna go ahead and run this from the command line with a seed of one. So I'll do uh, period forward slash code, run split dot r with the one. Hopefully this will run and work from the command line. We'll make this bigger so we can see all the gory details of what's going on here. Wonderful, this ran through and gave me the output I was expecting. As I mentioned, I didn't save any of this to disk, so that's something I certainly need to add um, to my script here. I'm gonna save the output of run ml to a object I'll call model. Again, model will be a list as output, um, and it's got tons of stuff in it. So I'm gonna save the model object for every execution of this file as a RDS file. RDS files are a special R format, and so I can do save RDS model and then the file is going to go into process data and i then need to give it a clever name uh, i'll say uh, let's do l2 uh, genus um, and then let's put in here the seed uh, and i will use um, the glue uh, and so i can say glue around this we've seen glue in uh, previous uh, projects so we'll say library glue Make sure that's good. And then let's test this out. Let's say seed uh, equals 23. And then if we do glue on this, yeah, it inserts that 23. Ah, but I need to also add the extension, which is dot RDS. And so let's double check that that all works. Good. So now it should save the model object to a file in process data called L2 genus one through 100.rds. So we'll go ahead and save that. Let's come back to our terminal and we'll rerun our run split.r with that one seed. And we'll look to see if the output is put in process data. So that ran, uh, we can then do ls on process data and see that there's actually something there. Uh, let's go ahead and do an ls-lth so we can see how big it is. So it's 8.4 megabytes. Uh, this could get 840 megabytes. That's not that big, right? Um, you know, ideally we might only save the different chunks of the RDS file that we really want. I'm not sure what I want at this point. So I'm gonna leave it with the whole object um, and, and call it good. Okay, so the next step is that we need to link this into our make file. So the way these make rules work is that there's a target, the file you wanna create, a colon, and then the dependencies on the right side of the colon. 
Below that then are the instructions on how to build that rule. So we will then do process data forward slash L2 genus uh, underscore one dot RDS colon. And then we've got files that we need to be sure are in here, right? So we need this code genus process R. We also need uh, run split dot R. Um, again, run split is also in code. So those are the two dependencies, as are the three Baxter files, right? So we also need to put in here raw data forward slash Baxter dot um, metadata dot TSV. So we can put these on separate lines by putting a, a backslash. And the kind of annoying thing about make is that tabs uh, are used instead of spaces. So we'll do uh, Baxter metadata TSV and then raw data uh, forward slash Baxter dot cons dot taxonomy. Again, we'll put another backslash here. Raw data forward slash Baxter dot subsample dot shared. And then we will do the um, period forward slash code forward slash run split dot R one for that one seed. We'll go ahead and run make on that. Um, it says it's up to date. So again, if we do our M on that and rerun make, let's double check that it works. I think it's going to go through just fine. So yeah, that works great. Now we want to be able to generalize this to give it any seed. So what we'll try to do is let's go ahead and put a percent sign in there, which is a pattern wildcard. And we can then use a automatic variable of dollar sign star. And let's go ahead then and let's change this to two and see if this works. So we see the recipe that make actually used was code run split dot R2. So that worked great. Um, again, what it did is it took the number that it matched with that percent sign and is using that here as the argument to my code run split dot R. And we are in good shape with that. Again, if I do LS LTH on process data, I now have both of those two RDS files. So the next step, of course, is that we'd like to do all 100 seeds. But before I write the rule for that, what I'd like to do instead is go ahead and write the next rule and the next R script to combine the output from the 100 RDS scripts. So currently we have two RDS scripts. So let's start there because that's a lot easier than 100. I'm going to go ahead and create a new R script, combine models.r, and that's in code. I'm going to go ahead and grab my shebang line, and we will also grab microbeml. Uh, so that's good. And what we want this to do is to read in all of the RDS files um, that we give it. Um, and so again, we will do command args with uh, trailing only equals true. And these will be our RDS files. Uh, so that will read in uh, a list of RDS files that we're going to have to give it from the command line. And so we will use map because map is going to read these in and create a list of RDS files. So we'll do RDS files with read RDS. And I think that should work. Uh, to test this, let's create a dummy vector that I'll call RDS files. Processed data forward slash um, L2 genus one dot RDS. And then we will also do uh, this next one, but that's with a two. So now we have, oh, we have RDS files, good. And so then if we read in with map, it's complaining that I can't find the function map, and that's because I need to li load library per. I suppose I could do tidyverse, but let's see if we can get away with just doing per. This then is using the map function to read all that. Yeah, and so we now see that we have our two um, RDS scripts read in and as a list. If we then go back to our genus ML script, towards the end here, you'll recall that I basically now have this iterative run ML results. So let's go ahead and grab that. Again, I'll call this iterative run ML results. Right. And so if I run that, that pulls that in here. 
I could not find function combine HP performance. Maybe I didn't run MicropML. Okay, so we'll run that. And so now we see we've got our combined data. And then let's do a pluck to get the dat object out of uh, this list. And so we have that. Good. And then we can probably do write uh, TSV. And I'll put this again in process data. And I'll call this L2 uh, genus pooled HP dot TSV. And I think I'll go ahead and put in tidyverse rather than per because we'll also need that read our package to write out uh, write TSV. So now if we write that out, if I go ahead and look in process data, I see now that I've got my L2 genus pooled HP TSV, and that looks good. And let's also get the performance. So instead of trained model, I'll do performance. And then we see that we've got um, the two performance values. That's good. What happens if we do map DFR with that? Then we get a data frame, and that's that, I like that. And we'll pipe that out to write uh, TSV, and we'll use the same file name, except instead of pooled HP, we'll do pooled performance. And again, now we look at our process data directory, we've got that. Good. So we're making two objects um, here. So let's go back to our make file. So we've got that as well as um, our pooled performance uh, TSV. And um, I'll put that backslash in there. And then this depends on uh, code combine models dot R. I'm going to need to make this executable. So I'll do ch mod plus X on that. So we'll also need all of those RDS files. So I'll call that L2 RDS. So because the dependencies are in the order that we might run them from the command line, we can go ahead and use the automatic variable, the dollar sign caret. Again, this stuff with make, if it's new to you, don't worry. Um, I have a previous episode that I will link to describing some of the cool things that you can do with make. Um, this does get a little bit into the weeds I know, but um, it's, it's tremendously powerful. Um, alternatively, what you could do instead of that automatic variable would be to put the arguments right like that. But it's a little bit cleaner to put the dollar sign caret, um, although perhaps it's not as easy to read, right? I think I can clean up my targets a little bit by putting another um, percent sign in here. Uh, as a pattern wildcard. That way the targets aren't so long. I kind of did the same thing up here, but I'm not gonna use the dollar sign star. Um, that's another automatic variable, kind of like that dollar sign caret. Anyway, it cleans it up a little bit. So I need to create this L2 RDS object. And so for that, uh, I need to uh, do some more fancy uh, GNU make stuff. So bear with me here. I can create a variable seeds uh, that will be dollar sign shell seek one, one, a hundred. And so that should make values going from one to a hundred by ones. You can then do pat subst percent comma processed data forward slash L2 genus underscore percent dot RDS comma dollar sign seeds. And that should create all of the L2 RDS files. I don't want to do 100 just yet, so let's do two. So let's give this a shot. So we'll go ahead and do make that performance.tsv. So that ran through without any problems. I do notice that the code combined models.r call uh, does give all three of those um, individual TSV files. So that's great. Um, I can then increase my seeds to 100. So at this point, we can kind of take two different approaches. If I was working up on a high performance computer where we're using something like PBS or Slurm, which is what we use here at the University of Michigan, I can create what's called an array job. And so I can create an array of 100 uh, different targets and I can use make and then the name of my target. And I can use the syntax to, uh, uh, for Slurm to indicate you know, where does that array value go to build out all 100 of the targets, right? Alternatively, what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to rebuild uh, this target, um, but I'm gonna add an argument 
to what we used last time, and that's gonna be J16. And so what minus J means as a flag for make is to use multiple processors. So I'm gonna give it all 16 of my processors, and we'll see how long this takes, if it goes a little bit faster than the 25 minutes that we saw in the last episode using the future uh, map function. That ran through in about 25 minutes. Again, same amount of time that we saw with the future map function. Um, again, there's other things running on the computer in the background, like recording this video, um, to kind of sap uh, some of the resources. If I go ahead and redo the make call, it tells me everything's up to date and we're in good shape. So I know this is probably going long, but I, I've got to just like get us something practical at the end of this. So why don't we go ahead and take this genusml.r script, the stuff we had at the end here, and I'm going to paste this into a new R script um, that I'll call um, process pooled data dot R, and then we'll do library uh, tidyverse. So we have all that goodness loaded for us. And we can, of course, then do uh, read underscore TSV, uh, process data. Uh, and then we will look at the L2 genus uh, pooled. Uh, uh, let's do start with the hyperparameters. And we can then uh, read that in. And again, this is the same as that performance dat function or dat object. So I'm going to go ahead and remove this and pipe the stuff we read in into this plot HP performance. And we see uh, the plot that we had from uh, the future map function, right? Uh, again, things kind of peak at around two or three really wide confidence intervals. Again, these confidence intervals are plus or minus a standard deviation in the data. Um, I can get a little bit you know, more precise feel of the data by taking what we read in and plugging that into this group by summarize uh, pipeline. So again, I see that my three lambdas, two, three, and four, give me effectively the same mean AUC, uh, lower quartile and upper quartile. Um, again, it's performing really well. Final thing I'd like to do is let's go ahead and read in our other TSV that we generated, which was performance.tsv. And I'll get rid of this final pipe. And what we see now is that we have 100 lines uh, so we have a table of 100 lines with our CV metric AUC and our AUC. So this is the CV metric is from the, um, the training and the AUC is from the test, right? What I'd like to do with this is make a box and whisker plot uh, for the CV metric, so from the cross-validation, as well as the AUC uh, test set. I'll go ahead and do a select on the seed, the CV metric, uh, AUC, and the AUC. And so again, we've got our 100 seeds and our, our metrics. So I'll do a pivot longer, and I'll do calls equals minus seed, and I'll do names two equals metric, I put that in quotes, values two equals AUC. Again, now we have uh, it in a long format, and we can then go ahead and do ggplot, AES, X equals metric, y equals AUC, and let's go ahead then and do a geom box plot. So what we see in kind of this low frills box plot, um, on the right we have the cross validation uh, AUC, and on the left we have the held out, the test AUC, and what we're looking for here is for the medians of those two distributions to be really similar to each other. And what we can see is that those are like bang on. Now, if they were out of whack with each other, that would be an indicator that the data were overfit in the cross-validation when they were then evaluated with uh, the held out data. So we're in good shape. And again, we get a AUC that I think I said was about 0.63 or so, uh, which is not phenomenal, but um, is pretty good. And that's a starting point that we can then go forward by adding other types of features, perhaps the metadata, uh, perhaps we can look at other modeling approaches like random forest, but there's a lot we can do with and build from here going forward as we try to make this non-invasive diagnostic of um, screen relevant neoplasias based on information from the human microbiome. So 
There's more to that in the next episode, so be sure that you've hit that thumbs up button, that you've subscribed, you've hit the bell icon, you've done all the things to tell the algorithm, I want more Code Club. <laughs> but uh, I'd love it if you told more of your friends about what we're doing here. Um, as you can see, I bake a lot more in here than just MicropML. But we, we covered so much today. I, I wonder, you know, what was I thinking in trying to cover so much? But anyway, there's a lot here. Feel free to watch it a few times, really digest, and you have any questions, by all means, down below in the comments, please feel free to ask a question. And I'll be sure that somewhere along here, I did uh, provide a link to earlier videos where I talked about using Make. Anyway, we'll see you next time for another episode of Code Club.